Just one second. Let's just get one second, please. Really? Was it blurry? Good afternoon, everyone. I hope that all of you are having a lovely day. It is actually a beautiful dear day here in Colchester. And I, from Udayan's screen, I can see that Udayan is having a beautiful day over there as well. So very happy that all of you can join in for the third part of the series on introduction to Zen Buddhism. So today the topic is about the bull herding picture about the bull herding pictures and as usual we have with us Udayan Chakrabarti our friend our trustee and and uh, and Udayan has been able to with his storytelling skills being able to now uh, really mold a true fan club with people in the Dharma Center because of his storytelling skills so then without much further ado um, over to you Udayan you you are muted. Yes. Are we there? Yes. Can yes. you see me? Right. Okay. There? So, um, um, good afternoon to you all. Uh, thank you for joining this session. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you all on board. And uh, thanks for the introduction, Pante. Um, so these are the famous bull herding pictures. Um, um, these are um, traditionally used in the Zen training school and they have been around for a long time. Um, there are many versions of these pictures. So this is the very first picture, there is 10 of them. Um, just a bit of introduction about where these pictures come from. Um, so, um, more than a thousand years ago, a great Chinese master, master whose Japanese name Master Chikyo, um, he did these pictures as a training analogy. So it is for sort of the various stages of training <clears throat> along the Buddha's way. And then Master Kakuan, another famous master, about 150 years after that, he added some annotations. And basically the format is you have a picture, then you have a little introduction, a, a paragraph, and then a poem or two, and then later generations of masters added um, their own po poems and commentaries. And then throughout the history of Zen training in Zen monasteries in China and Japan, and now even in the West, you have um, Zen masters who would give talks on these um, pictures and what they signify. So it's a metaphor, it's, a, it's an analogy to stages on the way. Um, I'll come to what the bull is in a minute, but the, the basic premise is you have a bull, which is a, a wild creature, a ferocious creature, not to be uh, messed about with. If you ever go across farmlands and fields and you see a mighty bull with his horns bellowing, um, it is a pretty awesome, impressive sight. And what does this bull mean to us? Well, the bull is our wild, primitive nature. It is not to be thought of as the enemy that has to be subdued because that is approaching it from the wrong perspective. The bull is the dynamic energy of life itself. And the herdsman, it's his job to train, to gentle this bull so that we become humanized first. We are born with a human body. And as you know, there are six realms within Buddhism, the devas, the gods who are in ignorant bliss, up in the heavens, the Asuras, the fighting demons who are forever angry and quarrelsome, then the human realm, us, 
And then you have the three lesser realms, the animals, the hungry ghosts, and the pretas, the spirits, etc. But the question is, although we have a human body, are we always in the human realm? For instance, <clears throat> it's a lovely sunny day, it's Saturday, I want to go out, do wonderful things, and off I set um, to go to the beach or whatever, and everything is lovely, and I'm in my best form, kind, tolerant, helpful, compassionate, and then five minutes into the journey, somebody hoots their car horn at me, or somebody cuts me up, and what are my reactions? These blasted fools, can't they drive properly? You know, and I might go off into a chain of reactionary thought streams, criticizing everything, the world, the politicians, who knows, where does it end? Or somebody at work hands me something that isn't really my bit, and suddenly off I go into my reactions. These are the reaction patterns that the bull signifies. Another example, I'm going along public transport, suddenly, accidentally, somebody treads on my toe. There's of course the pain, but there's also that emotional reaction inside, isn't there? And the more we do the training, the more we come to recognize these emotional patterns, how we react. And more often than not, if we are honest with ourselves, and if we are actually aware, these reactions is what causes all the problems. In the Mahayana school, of which Zen is one school, there is a famous saying, the passions are the Buddha nature, the Buddha nature is the passions. <clears throat> now we have to be careful with a statement like that. That doesn't mean that I just go out and act out my passions willy-nilly and let it, let it all rip. No. What it actually means is the energy that is within the passions. And don't forget, we mammalians, during our evolution process, and I speak as a scientist now, um, during our evolutionary process, the primeval thing that we share in common with all other mammals and primates and animals generally, is the emotions. The rational, cognitive, reasoning, logical abilities developed much later. So our frontal lobe the, in our brain, the cerebral hemispheres, the frontal lobe, which is responsible for all the higher executive functions, rationalizing, logic, um, uh, memory, all these things developed much, much later. We are warm-blooded mammals and we are prone to react hotly. And if you've ever been in a gentle discussion with a few friends, what turns out to what starts off as a gentle discussion, you may note suddenly can become quite heated. So if I pick on one of your particular sticking points, let's say you have a particular view on politics or philosophy or sports or whatever, even Buddhism, At some point, the gentle debate can suddenly turn quite sparky, can't it? Passions can fly, and we suddenly forget that we're being carried away. And you know, in English language, when we lost the plot a little bit and we've been so enraged, and later, much later, when all the passions are spent and the energy of the anger or rage has subsided, what do we say? My goodness! I don't know what came over me. I got carried away, don't we? And that's the bull. Something carries us over, takes us beyond the human state. Of course, when everything is going wonderfully and uh, smoothly, as we say, when the tide is on our side, it's all pleasant, isn't it? And I, in cold blood, always think, but I'm a reasonable person. I'm not prone to such outbursts. And uh, if we are really honest with ourselves and aware and prepared to look at ourselves, then we'll notice, and this is what the training does, we'll notice these outbursts. 
in the training, we might get quite impressed by the sublime scriptures, you know, the Diamond Sutra or this Sutra or that Sutra, and some of it is most profound and lofty indeed. But we can know it a lot in the head, but if our day-to-day -day life doesn't reflect it, we haven't really gone very far, have we? So back to the pictures. Here we see a young herdsman. He's completely lost. His feet are pointing one way. His head is pointing the other way. He has lost his bull. Now the introduction to it, and I'll, and I'll comment, by the way, um, those of you that are really interested, um, these pictures are, by the way, are available on Wikipedia, so you, you can get them from there. There are lots of variations of these pictures. This is the classical one by Master Kakuan from over 1100, uh, about 1000 years ago. There are more modern versions, which perhaps don't reflect the, the, the pointers as accurately as these classical paintings. Um, they're actually, the originals are in a famous Zen monastery in Kyoto. But as I said earlier, practically all Zen monasteries all over the world will have a set of these pictures. The paintings are beautiful, Chinese uh, landscape um, uh, brush painting style. And they do reflect very accurately what is going on within the heart of the herdsman. Clearly, Although we have separated the bull and the herdsman, obviously they are meant to be one. And gradually through the process of training, they become fully one. And then the passions, the irrational fires, and you know about the fires, the three signs of Buddhism, the irrational fires then become gentled, humanized, and then the Buddha nature takes over and as the great masters, as Lord Buddha himself has shown, that a life can be led, lived in harmony, in peace with all that is, full of wisdom and compassion, the two great pillars of Buddhism. So the first picture, the title is Searching for the Bull. And I'll quote, um, if you're interested, the book, um, to really go into this in detail, um, the book that has guided me a lot over the years. And this is a book I first started studying more than 30 years ago. And it is a book that I have read more than 100 times. And every time I read it over the years, new pointers, new insights emerge. And what I thought I understood 10 years ago, when I read that same sentence 10 years later, amazingly new insights, new angles, come to be, come to awareness. So the book is Gentling the Bull, and it's the 10 bull pictures, a spiritual journey by the venerable Miyokyoni, who I'm grateful enough to count as my teacher. Uh, she is no longer, she passed away in 2007, but at Shoboan in North London, St. John's Wood, um, her training center, we carry on. And I have recommended this book um, in my very first talk uh, three or four months ago, Gentling the Bull, the 10 Bull Pictures, A Spiritual Journey by Venerable Miyokuni. You can get it on um, Google, etc. So the first picture is titled Searching for the Bull. The search for what? The bull has never been estranged, but the herdsman has estranged himself from himself and so the bull became lost in the dust. The home mountains recede ever, ever further, and suddenly the herdsman finds himself on entangled paths. Lust for gain and fear of loss flare up like a conflagration, and views of right and wrong oppose each other like spears on a battlefield. And the poem to go along with it is, alone in a vast wilderness, the herdsman searches for his bull in the tall grass. Wide flows the river, far range the mountains, and ever deeper into the wilderness goes the path. Wherever he seeks, he can find no trace, no clue, 
exhausted and in despair. As the evening darkens, he hears only the crickets in the maples. A very evocative poem. Um, the traditional Chinese were very much into nature and a lot of their allegories are harmonized with the flowing patterns of nature. So you can imagine the scene. The young herdsman has lost his bull and it's precious to him as is our heart bull, precious to us. And he's desperately seeking to find it. And he looks this way and that way. His feet are pointing one way. His head is pointing another way. He seeks, but in vain. He crosses mountains and he crosses rivers. He gets swamped in the muds and in the morass. And at the end of the day, he still hasn't found his bull. And it's a lamentable tale. Wherever he seeks, he can find no trace, no clue, exhausted and in despair. As the evening darkens, he hears only the crickets in the maples. So this is really the beginning of the spiritual path. At some point in life, we perhaps come to a stage where we realize something is missing in our lives. We might have a lovely job. We might have a lovely family. The bills are well paid for and everything seems to be okay but suddenly one day something begins to stir in us. Or maybe we had a great disappointment in life, whatever that may be. That great promotion I was expecting at work for which I worked so hard for years and it was ruthlessly taken away from me. Or maybe after 30 years of being happily married, a sudden divorce. Or maybe the children are not what they expected to be. I don't know, whatever. Suddenly, a disaster strikes and we are taken out of our comfort zone. And it shakes us to our foundations. It causes us all sorts of problems and we don't know what to do. Or maybe by a great grace, we have met someone special. Maybe that someone shows us that there is another way to be. Maybe that one is very calm. And maybe you met somebody at work or in your family life or through an accident. You met someone and suddenly you feel, gosh, that person has something. What is it? However, we get there, once we get there, that's searching for the bull. We have now started on the, and we are now looking around. Maybe we study different religious systems. Maybe we look at different psychology systems. Maybe we look at folk religions or whatever. But eventually we perhaps stumble across Buddhism. Or maybe we were born into it and it was our family religion that our parents imbibed in us, but we didn't take it seriously. And maybe one day suddenly it starts stirring within us. We then move on to the second picture, which is called Finding the Traces. And this is a very critical stage. So if we can go to the second picture, please, Bante. Right. So here we can see that the young herdsman feet and face and body are aligned in the same direction. And if you look very carefully in front of the herdsman feet, it, you probably may not see it as well. But if you saw the original big paintings, you'll see hoof prints, footprints of the bull on the ground. He's actually seen the footprints. He's found the traces. What does that mean? The herdsman has now read a few books on Buddhism. It agrees with his heart. The herdsman, i.e. the trainee, has perhaps read on Christianity or uh, other religions or Hinduism or whatever, or psychology, but 
through an affinity link, we, in Buddhism we say one has affinity links, the very fact that we are all here together following the Buddha's way clearly shows that rather than choosing another system, we have chosen the Buddha's way and obviously it means we have affinity links, whether that's from past lives or whatever, I, I won't go into that right now, but clearly all we can say is out of all the systems available to us, and by golly, there are loads of systems available nowadays, um, and with every passing day, there is some new system, new way of looking at things, um, um, rehashing the same old truth, but anyway, there are lots and lots of systems, and we have chosen to follow the Buddha's way. So we perhaps go along to a Dharma center like this one. We listen to a few talks. We perhaps meet a great teacher who inspires us, influences us, and then we start the training. So already you can see that there is a correction in this picture. The, the face, the body, he's eagerly following the footprints. What does it say in the blurb for the second picture? I'll read. Finding the traces, reading the sutras and listening to the teachings, the herdsman had an inkling of their message and meaning. He has discovered the traces. Now he knows that however varied and manifold, yet all things are of the one gold, and that his own nature does not differ from that of any other. But he cannot yet distinguish between what is genuine and what is fake still less between the true and the false. He can thus not enter the gate and only provisionally can it be said that he has found the traces. And the poem to go along with it is, under the trees by the water, the bull's traces run here and there. Has the herdsman found the way through the high scented grass? However far the bull may now run, even up the far mountains, with a nose reaching up to the sky, he cannot hide himself any longer. So the herdsman has realized eventually, through some training, through studying, that actually I am the problem. In me is the source, the beginning, the middle, and the end. I cannot really blame the outside. One of the examples my teacher loved to give is, I like coffee in the morning and I like tea in the afternoon. And with my breakfast, I would like a nice cup of coffee to get me going for the day. And then at midday, um, mid morning, another nice cup of coffee. Now, supposing there's no coffee in the house and my wife gives me a cup of tea. What is my reaction? If it's, how do you mean there's no coffee? Come on, you know I need my coffee, I must have it. If it's something like that, that's a pretty hot reaction, isn't it? It's quite obvious the coffee ran out and instead my wife or my friend, what or whoever, has given me a cup of tea. If it's, oh, is there no more coffee left? Okay, that's fine, thank you. If, however, it's the first set of reactions and my morning starts off with a bitter row with the wife or with or wherever, my housemate, my flatmate, whatever. Well, it's not a good start to the day, is it? And it's not very humanizing, is it? Now, on this particular theme, there is a, um, a, a great um, uh, statement, a Zen statement, um, the great third patriarch of Zen, the Chinese third patriarch, remember I told you in a previous talk that Bodhidharma, the great South Indian monk took uh, Zen to China, the essence of Zen, um, and he then transmitted it on and you had six patriarchs and then the patriarchy got dissolved because of various reasons. But the third patriarch, Master Sosan, S-O-S-A-N, he wrote a seminal poem called On Faith in the Heart. And there he starts the opening lines, the great way is not difficult. It simply avoids picking and choosing. And now we're into the heart of the training. Isn't our life all about picking and choosing? The Buddha said, suffering it is when I do not get what I want. Suffering it is when I end up with what I do not want. 
and that's picking and choosing. I like to get what I want, the promotion, the better house, the better car, all that. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. We all aspire to a better life standard, yes. But it's the possessive quality of that desire. It's the clinging. And you remember the, uh, the, 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 uh, the series Pratitya Samutpada, dependent origination or arising due to conditions, the 12 links. One of them is desire and then leading on to that is clinging, tanha the one that I cannot have, I cannot do without it. Well, that's the kind of bull, that's the energy of the bull. So, and don't we do that in life all the time? I must have this, I must do this, if only this, if only that. So that's picking and choosing. We need to be careful because all of us are different and we all have natural inclinations, which of course we respect. Um, some eat rice, some eat bread, some eat pastas, uh, whatever. But if something is not available and I'm offered some alternative food, if I lose the plot about it, that's not very civilized and human, is it? It's not, certainly not a gentled man. Don't forget the word gentleman actually comes from the gentled man which is what we are talking about here. So these reactions are very important. And a lot of the training is to do with these reactions. And a nice story on that particular theme um, is um, one of the great uh, stories, again, my teacher used to really like, was um, 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 this um, <coughs> devotee. It's, a, it's an Indian story. Um, excuse me. It's a devotee who has been meditating in the woods for months and months and many years, and he's meditating on Krishna. And there he is every day for hours on end, sitting in meditation, Krishna, Krishna, oh Krishna, Krishna, <coughs> when will you come and see me? When will you bless me with your grace? And this goes on. And eventually Krishna is inspired and he feels right, <coughs> Today, <coughs> I will go and give my blessings to this worthy disciple. And Krishna comes along from the heavens and he approaches the disciple from the back. And there is the disciple earnestly, Krishna, Krishna, when would you come to me? Krishna, Krishna. Krishna comes from the back, taps him on the back and the young disciple devotee, how dare you? disturb me, can't you see I'm meditating? Krishna turns round and walks away. It's a very useful story to remember. In our earnest quest on the spiritual tradition, let us not forget the basic human side of it. You see, now that we are moving on to so-called a higher plane, we are spiritual. We might forget the ordinary basic things of daily life, courtesy, politeness, manners, very unpopular things nowadays, because nowadays um, everybody lets rip. Just do your thing, man. Isn't that what they say? Let it all out. Let me express myself. You know, so you see on television, politicians, everybody. I mean, very rarely do you actually see a dignified character, you know? People are full of it. And even psychotherapists and psychiatrists um, encourage to let your emotions all out. Don't hide anything. Just let you, others have it. I'll give you a piece of my mind. And maybe that's why there's so much anarchy and strife and tension in the world in general. So it's important to be careful of um, the emotional patterns, the reactions and um, I keep on going, going on and on, and some of you might get bored. Gosh, he does go on about the passions and the fires. But um, as I said, knowledge in the head, I mean, you can give an excellent talk and you can know all the doctrine and theory, but as a human being, if you um, show those reactions, um, you know, it, it's embarrassing, isn't it? And then 
you yourself. We ourselves got, oh my God, what did I do? I, I, I was appalling. And then you, we have regrets and this and that. And, you know, I'm so sorry. I don't know what came over me all that and you know it can be actually quite dangerous I mean I've seen occasions at work where people have you know lost their cool and and disciplinary action and sometimes you know you lose your job over it so it's very important um, and you see it all around don't we don't we especially with celebrities and VIPs you know acting as if as if they're prima donnas and you know the the, the bee's knees and all that kind of stuff so we need to be careful that um, we are not picking and choosing all the time, yeah? So if I'm in a position where, let's say, I'm at work and I have a dubious manager who I don't get on well with, yes, it would be nice if there was a better manager who I actually get on with, but that's what life is. You know, we're, 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 you know I mean, I wish... I'm approaching middle age now and I wish, you know, my tummy was a bit slimmer and I was uh, what I was when I was 30 years old. And, you know, um, I do the usual healthy thing, but I can't really start complaining about, you know, approaching middle age and then, you know, going all over the place and spending a lot of money on Botox injections and the latest health fads and this and that, trying to, you know, remain eternally young. Um, we're not accepting what is and what is is i'm not young anymore and soon my faculties may not be as good as they used to be and to you know age gracefully but of course that's not what we see nowadays we're picking and choosing where does it end it eventually leads to misery as the buddha himself said suffering i teach and the way out of suffering so this way is the way of enduring the fires, and that is the the rites, the fire of purification. You know, in all these religious rituals, you have the holy fire. What that signifies is the fire that purifies me, the fire that burns me away. Because you see, when we have these incredible emotions, and you know, I, I hope you all know what I'm talking about, you know, when something that I'm really, really upset about, you know, really angry and, you know, it may be there for years. You know, we call it post-traumatic stress disorder in modern psychiatry, but an insult that happened years ago, somebody, you know, got in my way and prevented me from having my way. Gosh, that feeling of hurt, insult, how dare he? And all I tried to do was help him. Um, that can last with us for years, vengeance, you know? What is all that about? I haven't let go of it. I'm hanging on to it. I'm making a drama out of it. You know, quite often, isn't it the case that let's say something happens at work or, or in the house and, and, you know, I have an outburst and I don't let it go. I then come back home and I've got a, you know, um, a, a scowl on my face and, you know, I'm bringing that energy, negative energy back home. And I'm actually replaying that incident again and again in my, um, again and again in my mind. You know, I should have done this. I should have said this. Tomorrow I'm going to show him. I know what I'm going to do tomorrow. And I've even made, perhaps even made notes. I'm going to show him up tomorrow. Well, that's picking and choosing. That's not accepting what is. I mean, obviously, if somebody's blatantly insulting me and whatever, um, if it's wrong, if it's not acceptable, of course, I try to defend myself, but not in a heated, asura, demon-like way. That's what the fighting demons do. Their nature is to fight. Um, so if we see this pattern, then we need to kind of work with it. And this... Um, emotional energy that erupts. So when my will is thwarted, when I don't get what I really want, where, when I end up, for instance, I'll give you an example. Um, when I used to go to Shoboan, I haven't gone recently because of COVID and everything, but when I used to go to Shoboan um, um, on a Saturday work party um, in the morning, we had to, we were all assigned various tasks, yeah? 
Um, some of us would be allowed to work inside the temple, um, hoovering, dusting, cleaning the altar, that kind of thing. Um, some of us would be told to go and work outside. Now, on a rainy day, you don't really, on a cold rainy day, uh, unless it's raining vigorously, in which case we weren't uh, told to work outside. But it's, if it's mild rain, just a bit of drizzle or and it's cold, you don't really want to go into the garbage heap and do the composting and stuff. You'd much rather be in the, in the, in the shrine room, you know, hoovering and dusting uh, the Buddha Rupa, the altar, you know, that kind of thing. But uh, on a certain day, I remember, you know, um, I'd been in the group for a long time and I got assigned uh, the job of sorting out the compost, you know, rotting vegetables and organic waste and all that. And it was raining and <laughs> it was a bit humid as well. And the flies were everywhere. And, you know, some other beginners got allotted the so-called easier task. And, you know, there was this little thing in me. Gosh, I've been here all these years. I've done my bit. Why couldn't she ask them to do it? Why me? And, you know, it took me a good, good 15, 20 minutes before that. It wasn't a drastic fire because, you know, it wasn't an insult. Um, it wasn't that affecting my career. It was, it was nothing really. It was my teacher. She had just asked me to do something. But of course, you know, I made a big deal out of it. And, um, and um, yeah, it took me quite a while before I actually started putting my heart into it, um, giving myself into what is. This is another of her mantras. Give yourself into what is here right now. Which means if I'm listening to somebody, I'm listening to that somebody. If I'm polishing the table, I'm polishing the table. I'm not thinking about what's going to happen later today or what happened at work yesterday, because then I'm not connected with what is the doing at this moment. And funnily enough, this is again something she used to say, um, one of my particular pet hates was doing the dishes, you know, cleaning up, washing up the dishes and everything. And uh, I'd hate doing it. And in fact, I, I mean, I like reading books and meditating personally, you know, because um, I think, you know, that's, that's what Buddhism is about. And the little trivial menial chores of everyday life, like, you know, cleaning the plates or, or um, sweeping the, the footpath or, um, you know, uh, whatever, um, doing, the, doing up my bookcase and making sure the dust has been taken from my shelf, all that kind of menial manual chores, well, I would rather not. And there's a lot of resistance. And then I found that when I actually truly gave myself into it, it was actually enjoyable, really. And this is what my teacher used to say. Um, just like, you know, when we do things that we really enjoy, I mean, for me, it's reading a book or, or, or perhaps, you know, um, watching some sports or whatever. We give ourselves into it. We're absorbed into it. But if it's something I don't like, like at work, filing, organizing things, um, folders or whatever, you know, in the old days, we had secretaries that did all that. Nowadays, we don't have medical secretaries anymore. So we have to do our own filing, organizing everything, um, you know. I always think, oh, that's not really my job. But anyway, when you actually do it, I'm, I'm shocked and amazed still that despite all that resistance to start off with, it actually suddenly something gives. And then you see the pile of beautiful, uh, clean, washed cups and plates and dishes sparkling in the sun. Um, it's a nice feeling. There's almost a little thank you from the cups and plates, you're at one. And then the so-called boring jobs of daily life are not so boring. And a lot of the times, most of the time, there's all these little niggly resistances, and oh, not me, not now, there's more important things to do. I need to meditate and sit on the cushion. And so I pick and choose. This is for me. This is what I deem is important. And these things are not important. So a big part of life becomes unlived. And those things do pile up. In modern psychological terms, we call it the shadow, which is a synonym for the bull. The shadow 
Um, you know, in modern psychological terms, we have um, two aspects um, to ourselves. We have the conscious aspect, that of which we are conscious, and the unconscious, the great unconscious. In Mahayana terms, this would be called um, the Alaya Vijnana. There is a particular school of uh, Buddhism called the Yogacara, a Mahayana school, which uh, evolved in the second, third century um, um, common era in northwestern India. Um, two great brothers called Asanga and Vasubandhu. Asanga and Vasubandhu started this quite, a, it's basically Buddhist psychology where um, it's all about um, the, the inner realm. Um, so it's back to what I said, you know, you know, in picture two, finding um, the traces where it says that he has discovered the traces. Now he knows that however varied and manifold, yet all things are of the one gold and that his own nature does not differ from that of any other. What that means is it's within me. So, yes, you might have tread on my toe and yes, it hurt but you didn't do it in his, um, deliberately, it was an accident. Or yes, um, um, something happened, um, you know, at work things happen, but you know, it's up to me how I react to it, isn't it? So um, to give you an example, um, let's consider three types of people. The paranoid person, who is eternally paranoid, who, who, who um, 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 interprets everything in a paranoid, self-referential way. Then you have the eternal optimist who interprets everything the positive way. And that too is wrong because, you know, one should be balanced. And then there is the neutral person, the person who sees things as they really are. So when something happens out there, trivial or whatever, the paranoid will naturally interpret, oh my God, oh my God, the world's going to end and look what's going to happen to me. The optimist is going to ignore the obvious danger and so it's nothing as he's about to step over the cliff. And the neutral person, the natural person, the wise one will see it as it is. So what that means is it's within. Look within, look within. And that's what the path of training religion really is. It's looking within and changing that which I can change. I can't change the world. And although we lead by, we live our lives by example, but I can't change the world. Uh, what I can do is change myself. And there was a famous, a great Tibetan master um, um, who followed on from a great Indian master called Shantideva. And Shantideva is somebody um, that in the Tibetan uh, tradition, um, they, they really go into his, um, uh, he wrote some seminal verses, and His Holiness the Dalai Lama does a lot of teachings on Shantideva, the great Indian master from more than 1600 years ago. Um, he said, um, the world is full of um, thorns and stones and all kinds of painful things. You know, when, when, you, when you walk across, you know, there's desert, there's thorns, there's rubble, there's everything. You cannot cover the whole world with a carpet, can you? However, you can cover your own feet with sandals, can't you? So that's worth remembering. Um, on this particular note, um, another little story. Um, on picking and choosing and what, where our foibles come from. Um, about um, 1200, 1300 years ago, during the golden age of Zen Buddhism in China, the Tang dynasty, which lasted about 250 years, um, this was, would be from the seventh century to the uh, sort of a middle of the 10th century AD. Um, there was a, a succession of famous Zen masters and they're what we call the classical Zen masters, and that's called the golden classical age of, of Zen. That's when all the high literature, and that's when Chinese culture, which then influenced Korean culture, Japanese culture, um, was highly significant. And um, during this golden age of Zen, there was a famous master called Master Obaku, whose uh, Chinese name was Huang Po. Huang Po is um, in, Jap in Japanese, they say Obaku. And Obaku was the teacher of Master Rinzai, um, his Chinese name is Master Rinzai's Chinese name is Master Lin Shi Shishuen, Lin Shi Shishuen. Obviously the Japanese can't pronounce certain Chinese syllables, so Lin Shi became Rinzai. Um, and Rinzai is important because 
currently in the world, um, there are only two schools of uh, Zen Buddhism. Um, a thousand years ago, there were um, um, so there, there were five schools and seven houses of Zen Buddhism. Um, some of them became uh, defunct, they died, there was no succession. And today, to this day, we have the two main traditions, Rinzai and Soto. Uh, Rinzai Zen, after Master Rinzai, his teacher was Obaku, he's a very seminal character. Obaku was the master of the emperor no less the emperor of China at the time. And you can imagine how powerful this emperor was. Um, the emperor was very devoted to uh, Master Obaku and frequently would invite him at the royal palace to give talks to himself and his family. And one day um, after a talk, um, the emperor uh, took Master Obaku up to his grand balcony from here where he could see far into the distance and there was a big river going through the capital city. And the river was full of all kinds of crafts and vessels and ships going to all parts of the world. You know, the empire was truly flourishing and it was a great sight to behold. So the emperor turns to Master Obaku and says, rather complacently, ours is a mighty great kingdom empire indeed, is it not? And Master Obaku says, what do you mean? It's a great empire. And the emperor says, why? Look at the river. Look at all those ships, crafts, vessels going to all parts of the world, laden with um, trade and stuff. And, you know, it shows that aren't we doing well? And Master Obaku says, I see but only two ships. The emperor goes, what? Are you, are you deceiving me? Why? You can see so many ships there. Big ships, little ships, small vessels. What are you talking about? The river is full of it. And then Master Obaku says, no, 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 there are only two ships, the ship of fame and the ship of gain. The emperor took that to his heart, actually, to give him credit. He really took it to his heart. And then he started all the reforms and changes, cultural and political, um, that gave rise to the great golden age of Zen. I see only two ships, the ship of gain and the ship of fame. Well, that sums it up a bit, doesn't it? And uh, we need to be careful because those of us in the spiritual path, um, it's called spiritual materialism. We may think we have left the mundane world behind us and aren't we on a spiritual path and we are therefore superior to the common man and we know a little bit more and after 30 years I've read so much doctrine, I've been to so many retreats, I have sat thousands of hours of meditation but um, we can still go up the wrong way as has been shown by many you know, religious people um, throughout the history of religion. You can see um, at a very advanced stage, people can get sidetracked into the wrong way. And then they appropriate the powers that accrue from the training for their own selfish ends. This is what gives rise to cults, um, to all kinds of scandals. And, you know, there are so many scandals in all the traditions, um, Zen, Tibetan, Theravadin, Christian, you know, you name it, Hindu. I mean, you know, it's all over the place. Um, all kinds of scandals um, because at some point somebody lost his way who should have known better. And it's a you know serious warning to us all. And that is why it's important to maintain that humility, that reverential bowing, and to have the great guide, the teacher. You know, in the West, um, as you know, um, most of you are um, from an Eastern background, um, some of the subcontinent, um, we traditionally have a teacher, always. We were never allowed to meditate on our own. 
Um, if you look at a traditional temple uh, the trajectory of a temple boy or a novitiate, um, when you become a novitiate monk, you know, you don't become a monk straight away. You have to go through the preparatory phases, you know, which can last a few years, where for years all you are doing is sweeping the courtyard, doing all the menial chores. You're not actually getting any direct instructions from your master. I mean, certainly in the Zen school, that's the way things are done. Um, That's the preparatory phase. And then after a few years, when the master realizes that the student is ripe, then perhaps the master will give instructions on meditation or so-called advanced practice. This is an important one to recognize. I've already mentioned it, you know. Um, I want, you know, in the Zen tradition, for instance, in Rinzai Zen, we have the tradition of the koan. Some of you might have heard of what a koan is. A koan is one of those um, puzzling questions, so-called riddles, you know, um, which sometimes on the surface seem crazy. Uh, the classic example is, you know, you've heard of two hands clapping and making a sound. What is the sound of one hand? Obviously, it's ridiculous, but, you know, that's the koan. Uh, or another koan might be, before your parents were born, what is your true face? Clearly, you don't have a face before your parents were born, but that is the question. Clearly, it's something that cannot be solved by the intellect. It is beyond the intellect, and, and I'll go into that another time, the, um, the methodology of the koan. Uh, but anyway, those of us in Rinzai Zen, when we come into it, the first thing we want is, when is my teacher going to give me the koan? Because then, you know, I think I've advanced. But of course, the teacher doesn't give you the koan sometimes for up to eight, ten years. Uh, clearly, that's because one isn't ripe, one isn't ready. Um, because if these practices are given to someone who, are, who is not ready, it can actually backfire. Hence, the, the, you know, the constant stress on gentle but persistent sustained training. Gentle. If you rub, the, there's a famous Christian tradition, do not rub the vessel too hard and too strong, otherwise the vessel will break. And many in the spiritual tradition have done just that. They willed themselves so much into, I will do it, you know, I'll do a Buddha. They don't forget that very few people can do a Buddha and sit under the bow tree for days on end because they're not ready for it. We have to do the preparatory work. We have to go through all that. And we better not... Think of flying before we've even learned to walk. And that's one of the pitfalls in the spiritual tradition. We always think that we're going to, um, you know, well, I, I, you know I'm, 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 I'm more advanced than I am. Hence the persistent, you know, need for the humility. So back to the bull. What is the bull? What is catching the bull? Finding the traces, um, Obviously, I, 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 I haven't had time to go into all 10 pictures, and I'll do it as a continuation uh, because it is very subtle uh, and the pictures are remarkably accurate and they do delineate various phases of the training. What I would like to finish off with today is knowledge acquired in the head is not the real thing. Knowing something and being something are two completely different things. So finding the traces is getting started on the way. And that can take a year, two, three years for some people. You know, they're still at that stage. The next phase is finding the bull. And finding the bull invariably means I've had an emotional outburst. I got carried away. After the passions are spent and I'm all drained and thinking, oh my God, I did it again. I made, I made a fool of myself yet again. I lost it. Oh no, I got carried away. At least I was honest. And the bull has gone by now. That energy has gone. Yeah, it's far too late now. But at least if now I am honest with myself and I say, my goodness, such a trivial matter and such an outburst from me. Phew. 
lot of work needing to be done. Well, that's finding the bull. And in the actual picture, Bhante, if we can have picture three, please. Right. Thank you, Bhante. So this is finding. As you can see, he only sees the backside of the bull. The bull's gone. And the, and the herdsman isn't going to be able to catch him. The bull's gone. But he at least saw the backside of the bull. What that means is the energy has gone. I am drained, but I am honest enough to say I lost it again. Well, hopefully, and this is uh, the next in my next monthly talk, I'll start off with picture four, which is um, which is actually called catching the bull. And catching the bull is the critical stage of the training process. Catching the bull is having awareness of the energy erupting at the moment of eruption. I'll say that again. Being aware of that energy rising at the moment of eruption. Because if you are, then I'm getting angry. My, my, in my, so I'm in a team meeting. Somebody has said something offensive, obviously blatantly disrespectful of me and basically even lying. And I need to sort them out. The anger is rising. The, 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 the fists are clenched. The shoulders are tightened. There's butterflies in the tummy. It's like fight or flight. I'm ready. You know that primitive fight or flight reaction? It's all getting into gear. If at that moment the awareness is there and I contain that awareness, I'm getting angry. Calm down calm down the fires are rising that is catching the bull at the moment of eruption because if you can't do that there will be no training and i'll lose it again i think i'll leave it there for now Bhante. i just realized it's gone uh, about three o'clock i'll leave it there if, any, if anybody wants any questions and the next session um we'll start at picture four which is catching the bull thank you Would anyone like to ask Udayan any questions that they might have? Um, yes, Dil. First, thank you, uh, Dr. Udayan, for a really interesting uh, talk and your storytelling, which is so passionate and keeps us all from falling asleep after lunch. So thank you for that. <laughs> but in, uh, but uh, more seriously, it, it really gives me what I, uh, Bhante will tell you, what I like, it is actually opening of the heart and the training and not all the knowledge. It, of course, is needed for you to know where you are and to have the realization and to work on it, right? But unfortunately, I find that uh, in the practice I follow, quite often a lot of weight is given to knowledge and knowledge and knowledge and knowledge. And um, why some monasteries do give a lot of uh, opportunity for the practice and, and uh, some don't. So it, it's refreshing to see that you, you repeat it over and over again, because for me, having done years of the knowledge, this is what the practice is. But just a couple of questions. I noticed you were talking about the, about the six realms, and those are in our tradition, but we call the the karma vachara loka the sensual planes right so you talk of the devas the humans and you know and the lower uh, lower planes but you don't talk about the, the other planes that we talk about the two main planes which is the uh, you know we have the fine material and the immaterial where well, we are higher than that but so so we have 30 uh, 31 planes while you talk of only the six sensual planes is that is that all you speak of, or you don't talk of where the jhana planes and all come? No, we don't talk of the jhana planes because you oh. know we're we're still stuck in the very preliminary that we are not even human beings. So okay. it's better to stick to the here and now because those planes are all ideas in my mind. I mean, you know. Um, um, yes, advanced meditation masters, uh, you know, and even a lot of Theravadin, Ajahn Sumedho, he does not like talking about jhanas uh, because they can be very misleading. And as you said yourself, um, intellectual knowledge without the firm backing can be misleading right. and dangerous because invariably I will come to the wrong conclusions. Right. So, so, so do, 
Do you then no, no, have... Oh, you have what you are talking about are the three realms: the rupa lok, the arupa lok, the formalism, and and of course that that's a, that's a doctrinal, that's a different ballgame. No, okay. I'm talking about the six, you yeah. know, yeah. Um, yeah. basic yeah. realms, yeah. you know, uh, devas, yeah. asuras, right. those kind of things, yeah. right. Thank which, you are for common, that. which are common to all the schools of Buddhism. Yeah, right. Thank, Thank you for that. Yeah, Thank and the, uh, the second, uh, so I didn't know whether you had sort of left or you're concentrating, which is where the practice is. Thank you for that. But I suppose the stages that you have, like of the sainthood, the sotapatti and sort of those that lead to enlightenment, you would be, you would be talking about them, do you? Well, clearly we are stream enterers. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and, and let's leave it at that. Okay. All right. um, again, um, it is best not to be too guided by the fruit, right. because then we are goal-directed, and surely that is the essence of Buddhism, to avoid directed, goal-directed, yeah. and, you know, we give ourselves into what is, and yeah. in its own time, let the fruit ripen without yeah. me interfering with the ripening process. So, okay. we, we, because, um, of course, there is a desire uh, for enlightenment, of course, but at a certain stage, that desire too has to be dropped. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, that will get in the way. Yeah. So it is better um, to stick to the simple. My teacher used to say, just plod on through daily life. Do your daily duties as best as you can. At work, be a good doctor. At home, be a good husband and a good father. With your friends, be a good friend. As the Dhammapada says, to only do good, to avoid evil, to purify the heart. That is the essence of all the Buddha's teaching. And that's all. We can complicate it with all kinds of theories and they are useful to a point. But then on the heat of the moment, when something happens out there, do those theories come into the mind or does the reaction happen first? So, so I think where, where we both concentrate together is about the about, uh, this morning Bhante thought us about, or spoken before so many times about Patisandi, the dependent origin, but also the transcendent of Patisandi, which is where you actually grow it. And, you know, you uh, see the trace of the uh, bull where you lost the bull and then you see the traces and you actually then see the backside of the bull and you catch it. And the fact so that is very much what we also practice about, just not the dependent origin, but the transcending of the Patisanti, which is what all your examples do. And the other thing I found very common in our teaching and very focused is that it's always a suffering and the unsatisfactory and when you feel something is not missing and, or, or the pain or suffering, whatever disappointments, that those are the things that actually make you start seeking that something that we have everything else, but start Absolutely. looking. Yes. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. And that okay. is why the Buddha said, suffering I teach mm -hmm. and the way out, because it is suffering. It is enduring the suffering. It's not trying to escape the suffering, because most of us, that's what picking and choosing means. This is yeah. painful. Go away. Go. I don't want yeah. you. But we can't do that. That's part of life. And oddly enough, Jesus said exactly the same thing. Life is but a veil of tears. Life is an interesting, they're saying exactly the same thing, you know, so even in the Western tradition, they have that same commonality. And it's actually, obviously, within Buddhism, we have different traditions, you know, Theravada, Zen, Pure Land, Tibetan, and we yeah. say things slightly differently. But ultimately, yeah. it's all the Buddha's message. Being the great physician that he was, um, he treated each patient individually. And each of us have different capacities and capabilities. So it's no good giving the same medicine to every person, is it? You will kill certain people. Uh, as a doctor, we know that, don't we? So um, yes, the, a great teacher adapts his or her teaching according to the suitability of the student. And that's why we have so, this is why the whole edifice of Buddhism is so vast, you know? And actually I was having a chat with Bhante uh, on a previous occasion. You know, it is important to go beyond our tradition as well, because otherwise we get very stuck in my way of thinking, my teacher's way of thinking, our group thinking, all that kind of stuff. And that kind of holds us back. So 
um, it's important to look at other systems. Not, not, not I mean, it's, it's important to follow one tradition wholeheartedly, but sometimes it is helpful to look at other, even psychology. Um, you know, you can get great, you know, like what I was talking about, the conscious and the unconscious, didn't have time to go into it, um, but, you know, um, the, the persona and the shadow, which hopefully I will touch on another time, um, you know, the persona is the image we project to everybody. As a doctor, I must have a certain an image. Clearly, I'm not going to bring that image back home with my wife and kids. I'm not going to keep my white coat on at home, am I? Um, so I, lo I leave the persona of the doctor at work and at home, it's a different persona, right? But behind that, there is also a shadow, the one within. I tell myself, I'm going to do this, but that one within prevents me from doing it. That's why we make mistakes. I know I shouldn't do it, but I still end up doing it. Who is that one? That's the bull. Um, so that in psychological terms, it's called uh, the shadow. And, um, uh, and in Western psychology, you know, this comes from the great Carl Jung, the great Swiss psychologist, um, analytical psychology, as opposed to Freudian psychology. Um, it's about doing the shadow work, which means actually acknowledging the bull, acknowledging my foibles, my reactions, my dark side that I would rather not look into and I would rather not, you, rather you didn't know about it. I would rather I didn't want to acknowledge it, but that's the shadow, that's the bull. But it shouldn't be seen in a bad way. It is part of me, it is me. It is I who decide this is my good part, this is my bad part and you bad part, you are the demon, you are the devil, go away. Of course it doesn't work. It's me playing games with myself. So this is why rather, I mean, although it's useful to have these terminologies, including the terminology of the bull, actually all that matters is being aware of that negative, and it's not even negative, it's energy, it's fundamental energy. But if it's not channeled the right way, it becomes destructive. And it's not humanizing at all. It's, it's not even dehumanizing. It's a-humanizing. You know, there's levels of humanizing and dehumanizing inhuman, but a-human is not nothing to do with human. It's, and if we look at the likes of the great um, destructive personalities, the Hitlers or the Stalins or whatever, they had tremendous energy. They had tremendous charisma. I mean, Hitler even spoke the same language as Jesus. One nation, one people, one father, yeah? But look at the difference between the two. So that energy, and later on in the talk, I'll talk about what happens later on in the, in the series. In, a, in, in the normal course of training, at some point, bull forgotten, man remains. That's stage seven of the training. Bull forgotten, man remains, which means he's a gentled man, he's a humanized man, and there are no primitive eruptions. But if it, it turns the other way, man forgotten, bull remains. Whoa. And I think we have seen all of us in life, we might have seen one or two characters who are destructive and, and just basically demonic, you know, and, 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 you know, they might have a lot of power, charisma, energy, but it's gone completely the opposite pole. And that energy is very elemental. Yeah, it can go either of two ways. It can be humanized, spiritualized, becoming a divinity, or it can go downwards, yeah? It can be, you know, sort of dark, satanic stuff. But the energy of itself is the energy. What become, it's like nuclear energy. We can use nuclear energy to power energy in homes and farms and, yeah? Or we can use it to create an, a bomb and kill millions. It's a, but the energy itself is neutral. How we deal with it is our choice. And that's what the training is all about. Thank you. And you psychotherapists call it the inner child work as well, quite often. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Would there be anyone else who would have any questions for Dr. Dan? Max, yes. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Max. How Hi. are you doing? I'm a good beauty. Great. I really um, love this story about the three types of people, the optimist, the pessimist, the neutral person. Except, you know, you were talking about work. Um, what has been your most, um, I, 
most powerful ways do you think of dealing with conflicts at work? Sorry, yeah. uh, I missed that. What, what's, been most... the most, what's been the most effective way you've used to deal with conflict? You talk about living in the moment, which I find very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So it all starts with awareness, first and foremost. And yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a training practice. And um, obviously, um, the little fires are much easier to deal with than the big fires. Yeah. Yeah. Because if we're not used to training with the tiny little fires, all yeah. the little resistances and niggles in daily life, like, oh, I don't want to wash the dishes. Oh, I don't want to do this now. Yeah. Um, oh. That's where it starts. Because if it isn't there, there's no way you're going to have that ability in a very heated moment at work mm. where in front of everybody else, somebody is insulting you or, or, yeah. or you know, um, it, it's not going to work. But clearly what happens is, as I said, yeah. is saying something that is obviously not, not on. You know, somebody yeah. is saying maybe even basic lies against you. Mm. And you can feel the energy rising inside you. Yeah. You're getting angry. Yeah. 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 Well, if at that moment the awareness is there, I am getting angry. Mm. Calm down. And, and one of the things you can do is you take a deep in-breath. Mm. You actually physically expand your body. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you don't need to make a show of it in front of everybody. Yeah. Mm. But you take a deep end breath. And in that process of conscious, deep in breathing, you have actually broken the chain. Mm. You, you're not yeah. going to hear up spontaneously. And you mm. carry on doing it as you are hearing what the other person is saying. Yeah. Because it's interesting. You let things, if, if you, receive the negative energy you see it build up and i've seen that at work on yeah. lots of occasions and it's just yeah. being able to let go of that isn't it to live in that moment and to let go yeah. of that negative energy yeah yeah and don't yeah. forget that energy is not you know it's not going to go away in an instant depending yeah, on the, the force of that energy and yeah. let's say you're in a team meeting and you're sort of in the minority and three or four different people are accusing you of certain things and yeah. the drama is ongoing for 15 20 minutes half an hour well mm. the energy is going to be prolonged isn't it yeah yeah, yeah. And then, but, it is, but it's, it's that awareness yeah. Of what not, so as I kept, as I said, yeah. you know, awareness of that energy at yeah. the moment of eruption is catching mm. the bull. Yeah, absolutely. Unless yeah. you caught him, you can't gentle him. You can't mm. gentle the bull from a distance. That's why you have mm. the rope. If you notice yeah. in the pictures, there's a rope. And, yeah. and later, you know, if you look at the later pictures, there's a picture where, where it's actually called catching the bull and uh, gentling the bull. You're actually pulling on the bull with all your might. He's yeah. taking you away into another. I mean, it, it doesn't have to be anger. It could be sensual gymnastics. It could be, you know, lustful thoughts or thoughts sure. of gain and, and p p pleasure and God knows what. Um, yeah. That's what it means. He takes you into the high mountains or the low valleys, you know, yeah. all over the place. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it is a sustain and it is, frankly speaking, very, very painful. You've got to sometimes yeah. clench your teeth and hang yeah. on for dear life because you want to yeah. lash out and, you know, yeah. give the other what he deserves. But yeah. you can do yeah. it. Um, and that's yeah. the training. That's the thing that whittles away the eye. As my teacher yeah. used to say, the only power in the universe that can deal with this um, I that likes to puff itself up, you know, the nature of I is mm. I like to be praised, I like to yeah. be flattered, I like yeah. to be popular, I like to be seen in a good light. Yeah. And if anybody or anything mm. slightly, slightly dampens my ego, boom, it's like yeah. a balloon. It just wants to go up, yeah. up, up, yeah. up, up, up and well, away. It's interesting what you were saying about how people are preoccupied with the I now about getting one over on someone, etc. Celebrity culture, all of this stuff, you know, it's very much preoccupied with that I, that ego, you know. Yeah, it, it's, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a, a, at a practice level, you know, when the fires arise, um, yeah. simply to be aware of it. And if mm. there is awareness, um, there'll be less harm committed in the first place mm. and gradually with daily practice. But don't forget what I just said. It starts with the little fires at home. Yeah. Fire, yeah? yeah. yeah you, you won't be able to do the big fires. You're, you're, you know, you know, we all have certain viewpoints on 
maybe politics or philosophy or whatever. And we may start mm. off, you know, quite calm and cool. And at mm. some point, the conversation gets very heated. <laughs> and yeah. suddenly, I have lost it. And it's happened to me loads of times. You know, yeah. <laughs> you, know yeah. you, you tell yourself, come on, stay cool. It's only a debate. It's only my friend I'm talking with. And yet, at some point, can I let go of it? Can I just mm. drop it? Can I say, if you say so, Max? Mm, yeah. That's okay. Yeah. Mine's but an opinion. Yours is also an opinion. Yes, mm. your opinion is as valid as mine. And let us agree to disagree. Can we say that? No. Yeah. Yeah. In the heat of the moment, mine is the way. Mine yeah, is the only way. And you better listen to me because I know what's good for me, you, and everybody else. I'm God. Yeah. I'm the. I know. We, we call it the God complex, don't we? Yeah. yeah. Okay. No, it's very interesting. It was very. It was very interesting listening to that actually because. Um, you know, after what I, you know, we, we see that stuff all the time and it was just, it was, I found it very insightful, you know, from what I've experienced. So that was very good. Thank you. Great. Good. I'm glad it was of use. Thank you, Max. Thank you, Ruby. Thank you. Would there be anyone else with any questions? Yes. I think with Dr. Udayan, I think we have no other questions. Brilliant. <laughs> so we will uh, wrap up today's session and uh, the next session will happen uh, on the last Saturday of next month on, in July, uh, which is going to be on the 31st of July next month, uh, which then we will be continuing on the bull herding picture starting from the fourth picture. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Udayan. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bante. And thank you for kindly sort of um, A, hosting the whole thing and B, um, um, taking charge of the pictures. Yeah. I found it a bit difficult to do it myself, not very tech savvy. So thank you very much. And uh, have a lovely weekend, all of you, and, and good practice to all of you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Take care now. Thank you.